All right, hello everyone. Welcome to day two of Java class or coding class. Again, I'm very sorry that this lesson has to be recorded instead of um, in real time. I was planning to ha have you all ask questions, have you participate in what we we're going to do today because today we're going to be learning a lot of things, very important things. But yeah, so lessons will continue normally next week um, using Zoom. So this will be, this should be a one-time thing. All right, so let's get started. So um, I don't, I, I don't remember quite correctly um, what all you have been introduced to, because last, last, um, last lesson was very like introductory. It was just to um, bring you into what Java is. I don't expect any of you to um, fully understand like the parts of Java, what OOP is. Um, you, I don't expect you to have mastered it already because that would be um, that would be very unusual. I haven't taught you enough for you to master it. So today we're going to go a little bit more in depth into Sorry, my headphone shut off. But today we're going to be going a little more into depth of what Java is and um, the parts of it. So first we have classes. This is a very fundamental part of Java, very simple. A class is a user-defined set of properties or methods that are common to all objects of one type. So this sounds complicated as well. It's not. Like um, a class, you can imagine a class as a, as a classification or a type or even just a class of students. In school, you go to class. You go to a class and then you learn something like science class, history class, math class. But basically, um, it's just a grouping of things that are the same, they're the same thing. For example, we have human, the human class. So in the human class, I can have um, any number of objects and all of these objects are humans. So um, by this, you, you know that a class is just a collection of objects. So um, if I have a class called human, then the objects inside this class would all have to be humans. So I could create an object named Bill. And because Bill is human, he is in the human class. I can create an object named um, Samuel. And Samuel is human too, so he's also in the human class. Or Daniel, Daniel is human, he could be placed in the human class. It's just any, um, it's just a, just a collection of objects that are the same type. And um, this doesn't matter that much, but when you name a class, you should begin with a capital letter, like human. If you see right here, H is capitalized. So, um, this doesn't matter in actual programming. If like if you're typing your program, if you're creating, if you're writing your code, and this H is not capitalized, don't worry, it's fine. Um, like it, the, the the program will still run fine. It doesn't matter if it's capitalized or not. But um, it's proper etiquette to other programmers to um, it's like a a hidden rule, an unspoken rule that you should capitalize class names. With a capital letter, and there's a lot of these these um, unspoken rules in programming, and we'll go over them. And as you begin to code more and more, um, which will be starting actually next week, I'm going to have you all start coding yourselves. When as you begin to like, have actual experience coding, then you'll get used to it quick. So don't worry about memorizing like a class name should begin with a capital letter. And um, classes have four different modifiers, but most classes are declared as public. So um, you have the modifiers are things like public, private, uh, static, I think, and and um, whatnot. But you don't have to worry about the four modifiers. The one thing that you have to remember is public. We what we we'll go into private and the other ones um, later on in the course. But um, since you're starting out, all you need to know is public. This it's um. This right here is called a mod modifier. So when you're writing code, when you're creating this class called human, you have, um, you're writing class, obviously. 
you have class and then you have the name of your class, which is human. This could be anything though, um, just the name of class. And then I'll explain all of this later, but what you're seeing right now is class and human. And then um, the modifier here goes before class. So whatever modifier you have is gonna go before class. And since um, we're, we're always just gonna use public right now, then all you right here is just public. So whenever you create a class, just remember write public class and then the name of the class, and that's it. And then a class can be created or declared by the following. So you have public class human. Oh, and um, this this was a mistake. Um, p should p should be um lowercase. When you're writing all of this, the name that the name of the class doesn't matter. But if it's highlighted like this, like you see, this is purple. It's purple because the the environment, the coder that you're writing your code into, automatically highlights it for you. It's um. It just shows you, it just tells you that this part is code. This part is not code. This part is just um, a name. This name part, it doesn't matter. It could be anything you want. But this, this matters. Capitalization matters. P cannot be capitalized like here. P has to be lowercase. You have to write it exactly like this. C cannot be capitalized. No part of this can be capitalized. It, it always has to be lowercase. And, um, Basically what the public modifier does, it makes it so that other classes, like let's say I write public class human and then I write public class cat. But it just makes it so that other classes can access the class human. So if I were to, so um, you're gonna learn more about methods later, but this is, a, this is what is called a method. It's something that a class can do. So obviously if you, have, if you are a member of class human, like I have an object named Bill, Bill is a member of class human, and Bill can do eat. So he can eat food. That's literally what this says. It just means that any, any, anyone in class human can do this, which is eat. And this is called a method. And because this class is public, and this method is public as well, um, if you recall what public means in English, um, it just means like, like the little definition is going into like going outside and then you go see your friends in public. It's where everyone is, but basically it's um, where you're not alone. And when you're not alone, um, then you can share. And since we have public class and then we have another public class, since they're both out in the public, then they can share with each other. They can meet each other in public. So what this means is that they can share methods. So an object in um, in class in class uh, an object in class cat can access an object in class human or actually anything in class human. You could even use eat. And uh, yeah, so an animal like a cat class a cat object could eat. That's just what this means. It, it means it means they can share things. And then um, the cast part defines the class as just a class. And then the human part is the name of the class. And obviously, as you as as I've said before, it can be named whatever you want. And then these two brackets, this and this, are called delimiters. I'm going to explain this um, very soon, but they they tell you when the class starts and when it ends. So if you have any method that you're going to put in a class, you have to put it between these two brackets. These two brackets tell tell your computer that um, like this part, this method is a part of the class human. They have to be inside these two brackets. So when you have this opening bracket, then um, this symbol means that the class has started. It's um, Whatever code goes after this symbol is a part of this class. And then this means that the class has ended. It just, um, it closes off all the code in here. You can write whatever you want in here and then have this at the end. And then the computer will know that everything in here is a part of class human. Now going on to objects. So objects can be real world objects. 
they can be abstract, like rules of a game. Like for example, a real world object would be like a table or a human. We're gonna look at the human. So um, you have class human, and then an object in class human would be person Bill. Bill is a human, and so and because of this, he can be classified as a member of class human. But it can also be extract. So let's say I create a class called rules. I'm sure every classroom has rules. Like your teacher gives you rules to follow, and that's why they teach you. So let's say you go to math class, and then I create a class called rules. This this class is a collection of objects, a group of objects of rules. And all these objects are rules. They don't have to be physical. So these rules could be something like do not throw trash on the floor. That could be an object. It could be um, always pay attention. That's also an object. And you put all these objects together and they create the class called um, rules. And an object, okay, um, you, you do well to remember this. Like make sure you remember this because um, it's we're going into like more definitions of, of, of in Java and just coding in general. So um, you should always remember this. An object is called an instance of a class. They mean the same thing. But um, sometimes you, you would hear me say like this, this instance of this class, then you would know it just means it's an object. So um, the object name would be an instance of class human. And um, remember objects can be anything that's related to human. It doesn't have to be a human itself. Um, for example, if I, I, I could create an object in human, but it doesn't have to actually be human. It just has to be related to class human. So um, a name would be a part of class human. So I could write name. I could write hair. I could write like hand because that's just a part of class human. And um, a program can, oh, and um, one more thing um, for names, of uh, variables, I mean, not variables, objects and classes. Remember, you can name them whatever you want and you can put them whatever you want because you are the one creating it. So you could write class human and inside this human class, you could have a dog. You could have an object that is actually a dog. I mean, that that is completely up to you, but um, I recommend don't do something like that. Just follow the rules. Um, like if you have class human, then just put things related to humans inside class human. Don't put a dog inside because you'll only end up confusing yourself. When you're working on a project or something, all your class your classes exist for a reason. They exist because um, all your objects are similar. You don't want to have an object that is not similar in all, all your other objects. And then a program can create and use more than one object of the same class. So remember, um, you don't always have to have one object in one class. A human is not just one person. A human can mean a lot of people, like a hundred people or or a thousand. It doesn't matter how many objects you have of a class. And uh, any program can use more than just like one object because they're just objects. You can use them however you want. And a class determines behaviors and the properties of its objects. So um, when you have class, like let's say I have class dog right here, right? And then um, right here I have its properties. So for class dog, you have something like breed, like what kind of dog is it? Is it a Labrador retriever? Is it a Husky? It, there, there are multiple species of dogs and breed will tell you which one it is. Age, obviously it'll tell you how old it is and color, color of its fur. And then you have its behaviors like bark, sleep, and eat. These are, you can imagine its behaviors like things you can actually do as methods. And you can imagine these as like um, variables. And I'll tell you more about variables in the next slide, I believe. But they're, they're just remember, they're not methods. They're, they're like fixed things. Like if a dog is a specific species, like a Labrador retriever, you, you can't change its breed. If it's born a Labrador Retriever, it's always going to be a Labrador Retriever. If you were born Chinese, you're always gonna be Chinese. You, you're not, you can't just like suddenly change yourself to be, I was actually born in England. No, that's not how it works. 
because you were born in China, you are Chinese. And um, these are like fixed things, except for age and color, obvi obviously, because these like they can change and stuff, but they're not things that you can actually do. Let's just remember these are things like that are a part of you that you can't change, like your like your color of your hair or how long it is, something like that. And behaviors are things that you can actually do, like eat and sleep. And then um, a class determines the properties of its objects. So all of these, like dog one, dog two, dog three, dog four, they have all of this. Each of these objects has these. There's not a single one that does not because, because they are part of class dog, then they have all of these. And while class is created by the programmer, the object is created by a class when the program is running. So while you, while you yourself are writing this class, like you create this class, like you write it down, um, and then th like the object is actually created by the, the class itself. Like the class is the one, the computer is the one that tells the class, I mean, the class is the one that tells the computer to make this object. You can't actually program dog one. You can't say something like, you can't write public object dog one. You can't write that. Um, there's, a, there's a way to construct it. So to create it, which I will go on to later as well. But just remember, you, there's no actual way to like, just like write it up to, con to create this object. The class is the one that creates the object. And it creates it when the program is actually running. So it's not going to exist. Like your object, it won't exist until your program actually starts. And then you should remember that a pro an object's properties or values can change when the program is running. So you know that things, these things are just, the things that you cannot do, they're a part of you. But there are some that can change. For example, you can't change its breed, but you can change its age. While you're writing a program, you can make your dog age like two years or something like that. You can give it a new color, it doesn't matter. But just remember that these aren't just fixed, except for the things that obviously are. And this is an example here, you have the class car, and then its attributes could be motto, maybe the color of it, how many people are inside of it, and how much gas it has. And then its methods could be, you could have a, a person go into the car or out of the car. You could fill the gas tank, or you could um, say when you, you don't have any more gas. And then in this class, you could have an object like a, a car. So the model of this car, and the attribute is a Mustang. Its color is yellow. The amount of passengers it has is zero. And the amount of gas it has is 16.5. And then it has all of these methods as well that you can make it do. And here we have the basics of writing code. Delimiters. You have your, your, your um, brackets, as I told you before. So these, um, these brackets go into every single thing. Like if you look at this method, it's the same thing here. Whatever is inside this right here, between, between this bracket and this bracket is the, the body of this code. It's, the, it's basically what this thing does. So you write public void eat, but um, Java doesn't know what eat means. It just knows that it's a name. So in order to eat, you could do something like um, the person has to chew it, the person has to swallow it, and then you could write those two, and then you put it here, and then you don't, you never have to use those two ever again. All you just have to write is eat, because eat just because this is a method, it represents what is inside of it. So when you when you say this like human, go eat, then they they know what to do. They know how to chew, and then they have to swallow. And you just put these inside the brackets. And then because the public void E is inside these two brackets for human, then you know that public void E is a behavior for human, a method. And then the second thing to remember is the semicolon. This thing right here. Oh, okay. This thing right here. And what the semicolon does is that it marks the end of a line of code. Now, what does this mean? So what is a line of code, for example? Is this, for example, is a line of code. But the thing is here, what's different about this 
from this is that um, this right here, your class and your method, they are called declarations. Like if you look here, public class arithmetic is the same thing here, right? They just they just have different names. And then you have over here public static void main. Um, don't worry about static void main. Uh, you'll be taught that in a later lesson. But just run. This is like you could think of this as a method. Pretend this is a method as well. And then um, whatever is in here is 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 um, is what main is going to do. And then um, if you look here, these are called variables. But um, Imagine these as lines of code. Like these are a full line of code, and at the end you put a semicolon, and then you can go on to the next line. The semicolon tells the computer this is where the code stops, and that's basically it. Now we're going to go into variables. So first off, what are variables? If you took math class at a fairly more advanced level then um, you would know what a variable is. X and Y, right? You remember X, Y, and Z. If 6X plus 30 equals 70, what is X, right? It's very simple. It's just a placeholder. It's a stand-in for something else. If I were to write 5X, um, no, I mean 5 times X equals 30, then what would X be? Well, first off, x is a variable. Now, what does it stand for? So now you have to divide 30 by 5, right? Then, then you know that x is 6. Then all along, you, you, found, you found out that x was actually 6. x right here is a variable. It's something that stands in place of something else. And um, the first, there, there are more variables in this, but um, <laughs> what I'm going to teach you right now are called int, int and double. These are for numbers. Now, if you look over here, you can see um, int. This is what is called a data type. It is what kind of variable it is, because there are many different types of variables. So you have your data type, which is int. And what an int is, is that it is a whole number, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And, what a, now, and then the, like its counterpart is called a double. A double is a decimal, like 1.5, 2.3, 3.7. It can even be 1.0, 2.0. Those are also decimals. So they count as a double. And then how you write it is data type, variable name, equals, and then whatever you have, your value. So let's say I want to create, let's say this person is 20 years old. I would create a variable name, I mean a variable, that is um, 20. So I, I use int, I write int, I write the variable name, which is age, and then it equals the value of it. So in this case, it's 20. And then you have a semicolon at the end to mark it off. And you have a very good piece of code, int age equals 20. Now, source files. Sorry. Source files. Each class is stored in a separate file. The name of the file has to be the same as the name of the class, followed by the extension .java. So source files seem a little bit complicated. Trust me, they are not complicated at all. Um, when we get into coding by yourselves, you will naturally learn what source files are, and um, they don't matter too much to your actual coding. So. Uh, Basically, when you're writing classes, when you're creating classes, you should know that after you create these classes, there is a Windows or your computer will just create a file for this class. And then in this file will be everything that the class has, like its attributes, its methods, the objects inside, all of that. And the name of the file has to be the same as the name of the class. And it also is followed by the extension. So if I were to write code for Java, if I write a Java piece of code, and then I put, and then it's like it, it's a working car, and then um, then I could have class car store the file, and um, and then it would be car dot Java. You would write car dot Java because the class is called car, so you have car, and then the extension is Java because Java is the programming language. 
the extension is always going to be the programming language that you use for it. So for example, for Python, it would be .py. For Java, it's just .java. And then uh, Java is case sensitive, which means classes have to start with an uppercase letter. Okay, so um, I guess I was, I was not thinking before. I actually did not know this because um, I got these slides from, I created these slides with someone else. So I did not create this particular one, but um, apparently Java actually is case sensitive so that your classes do have to start with an uppercase letter. So that when you're writing your um, classes, make sure you start with an uppercase letter. I mean, you should already like, you should already because I, I told you that um, it's proper etiquette, it's proper manners to write it like that. But for future reference, in case you in case um, like you really want to write it in lowercase, remember that you have to start with an uppercase letter. And then the source file of a class is where yeah everything in the class is stored, and each class has its own source file, and a program basically when you're writing a a program. It's just a collection of source files. It's a collection of classes that will do what the program wants to be done. Now, libraries. We're going to end um, sooner this class because I don't want to. I don't want to teach you too much when you you don't have the ability to ask me questions in person. And I can't um, really explain more in detail. So this class will be a little bit shorter so that we can like really go into the content next week. Because there is a lot of things to cover. But um, you should remember that complex Java programs aren't written from scratch. Like if you have the best program in the world, if you meet Bill Gates, when Bill Gates is creating a program, he does not like pull up his piece of paper and start writing like I'm going to have this. I'm going to have this code, 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 code. No, it's going to take way too long for that. Programs can contain so many lines of code, like thousands, hundreds of thousands of lines of code, lines and lines of code. And um, it could be even more without something called the library. The Java library is like, it's a collection of methods and classes. So library classes are classes to have created by other programmers that contain useful methods for all types of situations. So uh, it's like, think of it as a calculator. If you're doing a math class and then you're, you need to calculate whatever, right? Like if you calculate some really hard mathematical e equation, like eight times 3,241 or something like that. Well, you can think of it in your head, of course, but instead of thinking of it in your head, you could use a calculator instead. This is like a calculator. There, um, other programmers created these methods for you to use um, in very common situations so that you don't have to create it yourself. And basically library classes are organized into packages. Java.util are utility classes. Java.ot are windowing and graphics classes. And Java.swing are GUI development packages. And library packages and classes can be imported into your program so you can access the methods from that library. And the specific name for a library class includes the package name as well. So you can see java.auth.color, java.x.swing.jbutton, and then you have jbutton equals new jbutton go, which is constructor that I will be teaching you later on. But just remember the specific name for a library class also includes the package name. So um, if you were to have like a, a class in java.aut called color, then you would refer to it as java.aut.color. You would not say java.color. And then um, these the common Java libraries, you have lang, util, net, and aut, and they contain each of these classes like math, system. And like, let's say I have math, right? Math con can contain um, like more mathematical equations. You can write one plus one equals two. You can write two plus two equals four in regular Java. But what if you want to go beyond? What if you what if you want to code in square root or exponentials? You would use Java.math. You would import Java.math into your your version of Java, and then you could use the methods inside math 
to do like square root and stuff in just a single line because it's a method. Now I'm going to go into importing. All right, to use the library class or to bring it into your program, you have to use a keyword import. So you learn what libraries are. Like all these are just collections of methods. So now how do we get these methods into Java? Because they're because these things are not automatically installed. You have to put these classes into your code yourself. So how do you do this? It's through importing. So um, it's called it's it's actually a command. And whenever you see import, it should always be at the top of your code, the very top of your code, except for your introduction, like a comment you're going to want to have import because, uh, I mean, in case you're ever importing anything, but um, basically just when, when your class runs, like when you're running your code, then your computer will know, I have to import this at the very start. Because if you have a piece of code before import, like if I import java.math, but I try to use one of its methods before I have the import, because the computer reads up to down, then it's not going to work because the import is the one that lets me bring that method. Um, like, I don't remember what method it was, just whatever method it was in, into Java. So, and then um, the end of the import statement has the wild card, which is also known as the um, apostrophe. Not, not, I, mean, I mean the asterisk. So you could write import and then I could write, uh, like let's say java.util, all right, import java.util and then dot asterisk and then semicolon. And then that would import it like this, import java x.swing.j button. So right here, you are importing a specific class. This is um, your Java, your Java version. So you could just have Java. This is your package. So this is java.swing. And then this third one, that's your class. J button. But the thing about you should know about this is that you could also write import Java X dot swing dot and an asterisk semicolon without J button. And then what that would do is that it would import every single class in swing to your Java. And then the package Java dot lang is imported automatically into every single program. And what it has are math, system, object, string, and other commonly used programs. This will be uh, our last slide because we are beginning to go into more important territory. So we're gonna learn what fields are now, fields. They're also called instance variables. And as you remember, an instance is an object, remember? So they are object variables. You can imagine them like that. And they're declared in the body of a class and they are the data of an object. So uh, these are, these are, um, objects themselves. Like if you see this private image picture, you have your modifier, which is private and an image and then picture. So what image is, is that it's, it's an instance variable. No, I mean, not an instance variable. This is the instance variable. The entire thing is an instance variable. Image itself is just a class. So um, both of these are called instance variables because they exist inside this class. They are part of this class. And then each field has a data type. So it could be int, double, string. And as you learned before, ints are whole numbers, doubles are decimals. Now what's a string? A string is a string of letters. If you want to write A, B, C, D, you can do that. Only if you have a string though. You cannot write A, B, C, D in a int or a double because ints and doubles are only numbers. And each field has a custom name given by the programmer. And fields are declared like this, private, and then you could have whatever you want, your data tab and a name. I can write private int, I mean, I mean private static int name. And then your name is whatever. And then um, you have an instance variable called name now. And then all throughout your class, you can change and use the variable however you want. And that's why you have this. And then uh, you also have private static final data type equals value, which creates an instance variable and assigns a value to it. That rarely ever happens because um, 
because uh like because when you're creating an instance variable like like private static uh you don't usually do this um outside of the constructor your constructor is the one that creates all of your objects like inside of a class because the construct because the class needs to be able to construct these objects according to their name so this doesn't happen because your all your fields would usually be declared inside your constructor because when you're creating your object, you might as well also create your variables too. Oh, actually, we'll go over this before we, before we end class. So field continued, private static final data type name. Now uh, I hadn't planned on teaching you private, but here we go. You've learned public. It's people can access each other, right? Now what's private then? It means well, just people can't access each other. Classes cannot access any class that has private. It makes it so that a field is only accessible inside a class it's created. So um, if I have a class called dog, and then I create a property, a variable, an instance variable called fur, and then that fur is public and dog is public, then you can also have another public class. It can access dog fur. It can see what color it is, how long it is. But if you if, if you don't have this, if you if you have private, then you, you cannot access this because it's private. It's private only to yourself. And then you have static product. These two, these two are optional. Static and final, you don't have to have these. When you're writing a a a, a instance variable though, you have to have this. You have to have either private or public so the computer knows what it's doing. And you have to have the data type like int or double or string, and then you just have to have the name. And then um, what static means is that it's shared by all objects. So let's say I have a static variable called x, and x is zero. That means that if if in one method I I add x by one, then x is now one. I have a second method; it will access it again. It will increase x by two. Now I have four. That's just what it means. It means that you share it. But if it's not static, then, and you write it like it int x equals zero, then whenever you meet another person, like another object, another method, they think that this instance variable is zero because it's not static, it's not shared. It just means that it starts at zero. It's, it could be, it, you, you can change it during the, during the method, but it overall will not change. And then the data type specifies what kind of variable the field contains, like int, w, double string, whatever. And then finally, the name part is user specified. It's what you want to call your variable. I've seen people create very strange names of variable, but in the end, it doesn't matter what you name it, as long as you remember what it's for. Like obviously, if I have, if I'm writing a variable for age, the age of a person, I don't want to have the number be like how how long their fur is you want to have it um accurate so yeah and then uh an example of this would be private in num a very beautiful piece of writing you just write yeah you just write private in num you have the data type here which is in you have the the, the modifier private and you have the name num and then remember it always ends in the semicolon to end the code that's going to be today's lesson. I think I might have cut it a little bit short. Don't worry, we'll be doing plenty more next week. And um, if you if you are watching this, thank you for watching um, my lesson, my recorded lesson. I, I hope it wasn't too bad because I, I don't usually do recorded lessons. I have done it before, but it's, uh, it's also a new experience for me. And remember, um, always, always remember, if you have any questions about this, please tell me immediately. Because it, because I have always, I almost always forget like what I'm thinking about. Like you are, I can guarantee you with the amount that you learned today. Because like, well, I, I wouldn't say it's too much you learned today, but it's definitely not a little. So you like almost definitely have a question about this. Feel free to look through the video over and over again if you don't understand something that's going on. If you don't, if you really don't understand that point, just ask me. I am more than happy to help you. Don't worry, like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna um flame on you, I'm not gonna like hurt you. It's just a question. If you don't understand it, 
it's perfectly fine. I would love it way more if you were to ask me your question than for you to hold on to it and then maintain whatever. Like, if you have a stupid question, I don't care if it's stupid. I welcome all stupid questions. I don't think any question is stupid. I, I, I want you to ask your stupid question so that you realize what the answer is rather than you keep thinking, what is this answer? What is this answer? I think it's a bad question. No, just ask the question. It's not a bad question. And then, uh, well, anyways, thank you for um, listening to my lecture. And I will see you all next week, everyone.